Okay, so yeah, I'll go ahead and get started to make sure that we stay on time. But again, welcome and thank you so much for attending our webinar today. I am uh, Kenny Taylor. I'm going to be talking about utilizing situational leadership within nonprofit and public service spaces today. I love situational leadership, love, love, love. <laughs> good, good. Then hopefully you'll have a, a question or add to the conversation. Just as the same with anybody else that's joining us today, please feel free to jump in anytime. We typically reserve uh, uh, questions toward the end, um, but with such a small group and the amount of time that we have, just feel free to pop in anytime. I'm honored to serve as the Director of Outreach and Professional Development for our Center for Nonprofits and Philanthropy uh, here at the Bush School. And the way that we start off our uh, webinars, or at least have been anyways, is to turn your attention to uh, some information about our center and the background of our work. So we were founded or we started this work in 2017, though the Bush School has a long history of educational opportunities, which you see there at the bottom. I won't go through all of those, but I'll certainly recognize our new continuing uh, education certificate in nonprofit leadership and a variety of our continuing and professional education courses that we recently launched this year. We'll provide some information on the back end, how you can access those uh, via our website. But I would turn uh, uh, your attention to our mission, which is supporting the vibrancy of the nonprofit sector. And we do that in a variety of ways through quality research, professional development, and engaged learning. Um, along with our value of supporting the vibrancy of nonprofits and the nonprofit sector, we also value the opportunity for all people to contribute to the sector. Um, our values of board governance and leadership speak to those being vital components, uh, board performance at nonprofit organizations and individual leadership at nonprofit organizations being vital to sustain success. And our value of engagement really speaks to our commitment to partnering, working and serving with a variety of community organizations to ensure that uh, communities are strong through the work of our nonprofit organizations that we know are out there doing good stuff all the time in a variety of communities. Let's see, to uh, set the tone here today, we're going to start out with just a quick video from uh, Dr. Paul Hershey, who is uh, no longer alive, but uh, is considered the founder of situational leadership. simplest terms, leadership is an attempt to influence. So anytime I attempt to influence someone, a group, an organization, I'm attempting leadership. There is no all-purpose magic solution in being a leader. There is no golden fleece. The only way you impact the performance of other people is through your behavior. Effective leadership depends upon what behavior I'm using in a particular situation. You need to match your leader behaviors to the performance needs of the individual or group. It isn't how do I behave with that person, it's how do I behave with that person in reference to that person doing a specific activity. Assess the person's performance readiness to do that specific task. Not that people have an overall performance readiness. It isn't different strokes for different folks. It's different strokes for the same folks, depending upon what it is you're trying to get done and what their performance readiness is. I'm sure we've all known some people who were quite willing to run with a ball, but didn't have what it takes. Other people with all the ability in the world, but hey, baby, don't saddle me with that. You've got to assess them both, ability and willingness. That's why coaching and mentoring is so important. 
People aren't just going to grow on their own. It's up to you and I to help them grow. Okay, well, this is a very simple model. It's called situational leadership. And what it provides an organization is a common language that you can solve performance problems at any level in the organization. It changes the culture. It gives you an opportunity to win. So thank you for taking the time to uh, listen uh, to that with me. Um, though I'm certainly no Paul Hershey, uh, what I will say is um, give you just a little bit of background on uh, you know, my educational journey and the work that I try to focus on some now. Um, my research was in um, leadership at nonprofit organizations. Uh, my PhD is in leadership studies uh, in itself. And while I was in school, uh, the reason why I've tended to kind of look at this and appreciate this model really has to do with making that transition from uh, being a practitioner into the academic space. So um, I spent, uh, you know, approximately 12 years with Big Brothers, Big Sisters, but the last part of my time with them was as the executive of their local organization over in Austin, Texas. And situational leadership is, uh, I, I believe, more commonly known in the business sector, but something that I certainly wasn't familiar with until I went on to pursue um, my education in the leadership space. But when I did learn about it, um, I was really excited and I said to myself, I wish that this was something that I was familiar with as a tool, as a nonprofit leader, especially as a young nonprofit leader at the time that uh, had never taken on a role like that before. And immediately the way that I thought about this model was, I wish this was something I was familiar with at the time because I could think of so many examples of when this model would have come in handy just as a tool, as I worked with a staff of approximately uh, 40 folks at the time, at our peak anyways. So this model was developed by uh, Paul Hershey in uh, 1969. Um, it focuses on leadership and situations. And I think generally uh, we've probably all heard some form of this, but different situations demanding different types of uh, leadership and to be a proponent of that. Um, to be an effective or to be effective, you know, leaders should have the ability to adapt to the demands of the situation at hand. And we'll get into it a little bit more, but more theoretically anyways, you know, with regard to this leadership aspect, this model is kind of based on um, the situation of followers with respect to the competencies and commitment levels that they have. And really what the model tries to point out is that uh, for any of us, uh, for any new employees, as you think about yourself in the role of a leader at your work, uh, it doesn't have to be exclusively in a work environment. Of course, that's the way that we're talking about it today. But really what the model points out is that, you know, skill levels and motivations, uh, they vary over time. And that is something that as leaders, that we should be aware of and watch out for, and on some level uh, lead and manage folks in the direction of understanding that motivations over time, they just simply vary. And we have to be cognizant of that as we work with folks along the lines of uh, developing them into leaders. So, uh, we talk about the development of followers with this model. So one way to think about it is, is the situational leadership really tries to position that leadership is a two-way relationship between leaders and followers. And again, as I just mentioned, what we want to, or what we need to look out for is how we develop employees, how we develop followers. And so, what Dr. Hershey tried to uh, set up in his model was that we start uh, very low in terms of our development levels. So 
then we want to move folks over to the high end to where folks are fully developed in terms of their productivity. So when we look at development level one, um, what the model discusses or uh, talks about is any of us can relate to this again, kind of back to the reason why I myself am a fan of this model is that as folks walk into our organization as employees, that they have a uh, low competence, uh, but they're extremely excited about the opportunity at hand. And I think we've all felt that before. You have a new job, you're really excited, you have this high commitment, uh, but you certainly don't understand all of the parameters of the work that needs to be done. Again, I mentioned even myself personally, as I walked into an academic space, trying to understand what is this going to be like, uh, felt very behind the eight ball in terms of trying to catch up with what is this environment going to be like versus the number of years that I spent in the nonprofit sector. And again, kind of back to what our role is as a leader is that we move folks along the, this line or this continuum, if you will, that we know that just as sure as time goes by, followers or employees develop competencies, but then some of that initial motivation that we had in terms of that excitement around a new job, that that dips down some. And our job is to move folks to the back end of this model, this development level four, where we as leaders have brought someone to where they started out on their development path. And we as leaders were responsible for getting them to the point to where their competencies are high, they understand the job, they've been with you long enough and you have the type of relationship where you also understand that there's high commitment level there as well. So um, just to go into a little bit more uh, detail and I'll give you a visual of this here in just a few, but as uh, skill levels and motivation levels change, uh, we need to understand what that is and exactly what to do. So what the model does is prescribe that there are directive type behaviors that uh, we can take on as leaders. And then there's also uh, supportive types of behaviors. So of course with directive, we think about how we provide instruction or give directions to folks, uh, establishing what the goals of our organization or our department are, um, setting timelines, very specific things where we can be uh, directive in our behavior as leaders. And then on the support side, um, that uh, folks are asking for input, uh, solving problems that we listen, uh, that we praise, uh, uh, and not to forget something like that, and also sharing information about oneself. So we get into you know, actually building a relationship with folks that we are leading and working with on some level. So here the model just kind of points out, um, just as we talk through in the components of the situational model in itself is where one really comes into uh, this new job. So what this model recommends at the time, we enter a new workplace, uh, we direct folks where we're highly directive and in giving instructions. And then just like that uh, second level of the model in itself, uh, of developing followers where we're highly directive, where we're providing more coaching at this point in time, when they're in the middle of not having started a job, but have gained some competencies at this point. And we migrate over to our next um, bucket here of uh, providing supporting type behaviors where we're empowering and recognizing the folks that we work with for the works that we're doing and then getting to a point where we can delegate out uh, in comfort uh, with trust that um, we know that the folks that we're working with or that you may be thinking of at this point in time where that trust is fully developed and that we know and we have confidence that we can give those folks tasks and that they will do it based on the high competency levels that they have at the time and their motivation to thrive in the environment that they're in. So um, I talked about a little earlier the, uh, the, the solid history that 
uh, situational leadership primarily has, again, in the corporate and business sector. And so um, this model has been used, geez, for a number of years at this point for professional development training at 80% uh, is the number that I found on their website uh, of the Fortune 500 companies. So again, a long history, not sure to what extent we've thought about a model like this for leaders in the uh, nonprofit space. I'll go back to uh, this was something that I felt was, uh, would have been pretty vital anyways, um, as I was out in practice myself to where, geez, just think of the number of times that we've had to lead folks and develop folks and having a way to think about that, especially again, as a young executive, where you may not be exactly sure what to do, depending on where someone is professionally. And then again, uh, I guess to the extent that it has been used, um, you know, viewing this model, this situational leadership model um, as a way for creating effective uh, leaders. So um, others have said that uh, this model can be applied in a variety of settings. Again, kind of back to thinking about it from a uh, nonprofit space that it's a, a pretty simple model when we think about it. Uh, the model brags that anyone can kind of take on uh, these particular behaviors so that it's easy to grasp. So uh, considering the variety of approaches out there um, to measure one's leadership behavior, this model's principles are you know, fairly easily learned and uh, fairly intuitive at the same time. So back to uh, again, versus being abstract, you know, it gives you um, uh, uh, actual directive things to think about in terms of what you can actually do, things, roles that you can take on as a leader to uh, develop others. And then it provides these specific guidelines of what you should and shouldn't do in a variety of contexts. And for those that are responsible as leaders in developing others, you know, just providing uh, a guideline to facilitate and enhance leadership at our organizations, which is extremely important, of course, uh, these days. Uh, we've talked about, uh, and this is, you know, well documented within the, you know, leadership literature about the flexibility that leaders have to have. Um, the model encourages that we understand where followers' needs are at, and then we adapt accordingly. Um, points out that folks act differently and have a variety uh, or varying levels of knowledge when uh, pursuing certain projects. And then research has shown that those that can switch their style, we've talked about this in the leadership literature, um, but leaders that can um, be flexible in their style uh, can meet the demands of followers and employees when we think about uh, developing these folks. So on to or thinking about, um, you know, how does this really apply in a nonprofit setting and over at public service organizations? So one of the things that I thought about with this or thinking about this webinar today, many of the things that we've heard, I guess, just in relation to the variety of uh, webinars that we've conducted since uh, April, I guess it is now at this point, is what are we going through with these turbulent times that are at hand? How nonprofit organizations have had to uh, shift, if you will, uh, nonprofit organizations that have uh, furloughed uh, downsize or some that even close all together. And so with that is just really to try to open it up for any questions, comments, or input around what should we be doing at our public service and nonprofit organizations. And with that, three of the points that, um, you know, I kind of pointed out is generally we need to focus on our employees. So if we think about, um, the new tasks that we have. So many nonprofit organizations have developed new strategies these days based on what they've experienced with COVID, uh, based on what they've experienced in relation to social justice, based on organizations truly having to go in and think about 
what are their service provisions now versus when COVID hit? So what do we need to do as leaders to support this work? And so just as the model points out in terms of professional development, um, this is one thing that we can certainly do is focus on the development. We've had a variety of examples of organizations finally stopping now that they aren't in the office to provide trainings that employees need, uh, to focus on strategy and planning at organizations now that they have some downtime that they've said, we'll get to it at some point. And we do all of this again in the name of organizational performance when we think about what are the outcomes that we're looking at in terms of whether using the situational leadership model or some other leadership model, what are we ultimately looking for or what do we need or want to happen at our organizations? And when we think about the outcome of leadership, typically we think about two things. And again, we just go back to the development of employees and then also um, the performance of our organizations or advancing our missions in nonprofits and public service spaces. Let me uh, say maybe stop there for a few and see if that sparked any uh, questions or comments that folks may have. Maybe I'll go to Deborah. You mentioned a little earlier about your, uh, did you say you had a like or dislike for this model? I said, I really like this um, and, and actually um, learned about it when I was um, a senior manager um, in a state agency and um, a buddy of mine had, had uh, come on to this stuff um, and introduced it to our organization. And for me, it, it changed the way uh, to think about management. Um, and, you know, when we learn management by watching other people manage, uh, that, that may not be your best source of information because so few managers have the opportunity to learn from the scholarly literature about what works and what doesn't work. And we actually know what works and what doesn't work. We've got nearly a hundred years of research. And, and, and what I especially like uh, is um, the behavioral aspect of this. I am a big behaviorist. Um, I don't you know, really care if you um, agree with me or not, but I do care about what you do. So it's not about intention. It's not about um, um, letting people learn on their own. It really is an interaction um, so my behavior influences your behavior, your behavior influences my behavior. Um, and I think this model provides uh, a guide for that. Uh, and, and I found it really useful. Yeah, I tend to, you know, even myself kind of lean to some of the behavioral stuff as well, too. We talk about um, whether it's you know, being self-aware or being transparent, uh, making sure that our morals and ethics are in check. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, can we develop as a leader and most of the literature or the literature on the leadership study space talks about that we all can develop into leaders if we work on it. And the one way that we work on it is how do we enhance our behavior uh, in terms of uh, working and partnering with uh, organizations and with employees all along those lines of, um, you know, building trust. But I, but I have to say, I always go back to, um, and so Deborah, I was actually wondering, uh, you mentioned that this was something that you learned out in the corporate space. Mm -hmm. I hadn't heard uh, much about this being utilized in the uh, nonprofit space for managers or one way to develop uh, managers and leaders. Um, but again, just back to the behavioral piece, this is something that is pretty straightforward in terms of understanding when you do have new employees. And when I, again, kind of going back to thinking about it in today's current environment, 
where we know that we've had turnover, where we know that we're introducing new folks into our mission, where we've had to retrain folks. So uh, the model also points out, as some of the literature points out, that uh, the situational leadership uh, is also important during times when we are uh, implementing, say, new technology at our organization. So though we may have had uh, folks in place for a while that we developed from where they first started to the point to where they have high competency levels and high motivation, uh, just as sure as we implement new programs, just as sure as we implement new technology, then we know on some occasions we have to start over and understand even where our most tenured leaders are at to retool them during that point and behavior comes in pretty or to be pretty important at those periods of time as well. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine. I mean, um, Kenny, you know that I've been um, an executive in a nonprofit organization too. And, uh, you know, when you're trying to get a group of people organized toward a particular goal, and it really doesn't matter if it's private, public, or nonprofit. The, the models work very nicely across those um, sector lines. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. Any uh, other input, uh, comments, questions about this particular model or other uh, leadership questions or styles at all? Uh, I have one. Can you hear me? Uh, we can. Who is this? Uh, this is Shekina. I'm actually a first year student in one of your nonprofit classes. So I'm very much interested in like the different uh, facets of uh, organizational leadership. So I wanted to ask a question as it pertains to this model. I wanted to know, can this be a practical model to measure uh, leadership performance, given that it's very difficult to decipher through different individuals motivation for different uh, time periods. How can, can this be a reliable model when you're looking at leadership, particularly in this time and how they usually operate and trying to see if it's effective or not? Yeah, that's a Shekinah, I didn't, I didn't catch a, a voice at first, but uh, thanks for joining us today. And uh, yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, just to make sure that I heard you correctly, can it be used to gauge uh, performance, I guess um, that's probably one of the criticisms of this particular model is that it's very prescriptive and where's the uh, theoretical pinnings for something like this. Um, when we look at performance, we'd have to go back to looking at what are the performance goals of the organization that any employee, I guess, kind of sets in and what are those particular performance pieces that we are interested in on some level. So this is a way more to um, uh, guide folks to where we understand their competency levels uh, specific to a certain task. And then more generally, if uh, individuals can um, uh, perform in relation to those tasks, then what we believe is that uh, organizational performance will enhance from that point. Does that make sense, Shekinah, or add some perspective? It does make sense, thank you. Um, any uh, follow-up or did I capture what you were looking for there? I think it worked because I, I, I wanted to just understand if it, more, it was because it seemed a little bit more just normative than objective. And I just wanted to make sure I had a clear understanding of what the model could be used for in terms of like organizational performance wise. Yeah, I guess if I had to think about this model, uh, you, you know, as, an, as, a, as, a, as a tool for anyone to have kind of in their back pocket in relation to particular task uh, in terms of a starting point uh, uh, for leadership for folks. And then once we know as, uh, let's just say you responsible for someone at uh, some organization that you're responsible for, uh, how do you get them through these vital tasks at hand? So this is about uh, more about developing followers uh, than overall leadership at an organization. And then when you look at things collectively, I guess, at an organization, 
you can gauge, uh, um, you know, certain performance metrics in relation to uh, particular objectives or tasks that you were trying to lead folks through. Um, others? Will Brown, any questions, comments, or any ads to this stuff? Uh, no, I mean, it's interesting, right? Because I actually haven't thought about this model specifically. Um, but it's the blend between the individual and sort of the situation they're at and the context that they're operating in. That was sort of what you just said this time. It's the, the individual, where their developmental level is, and the objectives you're kind of touching on, well, what is it that we need them to get done? Mm -hmm. it's, it's those different components that are really at play. The situation is both what needs to get done, what's happening in my workplace, but who you are as an individual. And I guess who I am as a, as a leader or who, who, who the leader is. Yeah, I, I mean, I think off the top, uh, you, you know, we, when we just hear, you know, situational leadership, I think our uh, first thing is to go straight to, you know, what is this particular environmental situation at hand that we're experiencing? So we could take COVID and just say, you know, what's going on with COVID and how are we leading uh, through this particular time? And then to, um, to really think about it more so from the standpoint of how do we then work with as leaders uh, employees, followers, uh, staff that we have at our organizations, and what do they particularly need? Right. Um, so, so you, you know, and we've heard some of this, I guess, with our um, you know previous webinars. Is nonprofit organizations seem to have uh, focused on the revenue that they've lost, how they serve their clients. Uh, and I know at least on a few of those occasions, we get into conversations about, you know, what about our own employees? You know, what do our employees need that are affected, uh, you know, by COVID at this particular point in time? So um, as we think about their needs have changed just as well, um, what do we need to provide from a leadership standpoint in this particular environment? Uh, to make sure that we can still uh, perform organizationally, but then also that um, we continue to, uh, you know, push forward as leaders, regardless of what's going on in any particular environment, I guess. Where I found this to be, and I think this addresses Mackenzie's question um, a little bit in terms of is it good for small groups, large groups? And I don't know how many people on the webinar have managed people where you are individually responsible for the performance of a team. And when your boss wants to know what's going on in your team, you're it. Um, and I think for young managers, early career managers, this provides such useful information. So I'm going to meet with my employees or I'm going to meet with a, uh, an employee. Where are they? Yeah, if you can, yeah. Where are they in terms of their own learning? I mean, I, I think of, of managers as, as being uh, primarily teachers and sharers of knowledge. Um, and in this case, if we look at um, S1, we're looking at people who really are at the beginning of their learning of this thing that you're doing. You know, they, they simply don't know it. And, and so your job is to do that teaching, um, the instruction, uh, and, and then provide um, ongoing feedback. And then in the S2 level, the way I think of that is, okay, they know more about this thing and there's still more for them to learn. So I don't have to coach them and supervise them as closely, but we do have to have regular contact. 
so that I can provide additional information. And then the, the S3 and S4, S3 for me is where I see an employee being able to uh, perform pretty much without any supervision. They have the knowledge that they need at that level that they don't need a lot of, of supervision. And then at S4 level, um, I look at employees who maybe know more than I do about the thing that they're working on and that others come to them for advice. So for me, it always provided a very specific set of behaviors that I could exhibit that would help the individual based on, on where they were in their, in their learning. Yeah, completely agree. I mean, one, one of the things that the, you know, model does for me is I tend to think about, you know, even still to this day, even now on this webinar is, you know, where I personally sit and either, you know, of these categories, right? So a very, you know, specifically, I tend to reflect on, you know, when I first joined the school and then when I got to fly a little bit on my own or go find it yourself. <laughs> uh, and then, you, have, you know, you go out there and you find out, okay, this is where I need to accomplish this at. That's the, you know, coaching piece once you get past uh, someone just telling you exactly what to do. But for leaders, you know, again, kind of going back to, uh, you, you know, I tend to think about the model um, when you're working with folks that you really don't have a relationship with and you're and you have the responsibility of uh, you know developing that person and so whether you're new to a role uh, whether employees are new to you uh, this kind of specifically says tell them what to do to start with mm -hmm. and then after you tell them what to do to start with as a leader you need to then start to think about what's the timing on when i can just go tell them what to do and coach them up some and when do I let go and uh, start to be supportive because I agree with some of their work uh, we're on the same page with one another and then when uh, can I fully let them go to go and blossom in the way that they need to uh, uh, as a leader uh, so that they can step up and do more for us at our organization and so this visual model, I guess, you know, really kind of says, or again, even, you know, regardless of where you're at, um, you know, for any of those that are uh, joining us and in terms of regardless of, you know, level at your organization, I go back to this just simply kind of being a tool that anyone can keep in their back pocket as a way to, you can think about where you are personally in that process but then if you also have the responsibility of leading someone, um, a way to think about doing that, um, not so much without a lot of thought, but a model that almost anyone can grasp on some level. Penny, and hi to you, is, Mackenzie. I didn't quite, so uh, with focusing and, on this, I didn't know, and, quite see you In my there, personal leadership style and study of leadership, uh, I focus on sort of that S3. That gives you some perspective. Did you have anything and else I've, that you And I've learned that about that myself. Or, I love the people that work with me. Sorry, there was like, I think two people talking at once. I think I may have lost you there for just a second, but I'm back in now. So yeah, back to uh, any other input questions from anyone. Yeah, I think the because I got kicked out for a sec. I think that's- I did too. Yeah, I okay. sure did. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm glad everybody was still here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, questions about anything in relation to uh, situational leadership or areas that we covered on this model today at all? Looks like a few of us get kicked out. Yep. I'll monitor that. Got it. Deborah Kerr, too. It was that A and M system. I wonder because it's uh, might have been everybody. Well, Brian, you're all right though. Yeah. So uh, I guess uh, Mackenzie, if we got kicked out there for just a second, but I guess I'd just turn to you once to say hello and thanks for joining us. But two, uh, uh, you, I didn't quite catch your question in the chat to begin with. Uh, but did that help perspective wise or uh, was there any follow up that you had in relation to your question? I think that that definitely um, helped. And I also think that it seems pretty intuitive, like kind of like, of course, I would want to be managed that way because it seems like a really natural progression. Um, and so I'm glad that it it is um, like it, it is a model. Um, because I don't, I'm, I'm lucky that my current manager, like I was looking at this model and I was like, oh, my, my current manager who was not my manager when I first started did this for me. Um, and it's really helped me like grow into my role. And now that I, I've kind of outgrown my role because of this like really mm -hmm. nice model, um, and I would like to, I was talking to Deborah in the chat and I'm like one day I would, I would like to be a manager and to um, know that like there is a model for how I was treated and how I would want someone else to be treated too. My question, <clears throat> I do have a question about, um, say you, say you are the new manager in an organization, but everyone else is senior to you, as in like have been there longer and maybe like, maybe it's me and I come into an organization and my team is all at least like four years older than me. Would, would this same approach work in that way? Or, cause they already know what they're doing or, do, or is that, I don't know. Well, you don't know that they know what they're doing. Well, like if they've been in their role for a long time. Yeah, and and that, yeah, okay. And you don't know what they know, right? So this is a way for you to structure conversations to get that recursive communication going that you learn and they learn and then you learn and they learn I mean, as a manager, your job is not to tell people what to do. It's to help them figure out how to collaborate and work toward a goal. Um, and, and I think you said earlier, it's intuitive. Trust me, I teach, uh, I've taught over a thousand working managers. Very few of them have ever had any kind of I guess, knowledge building training in terms of behavior. Um, so even though you may find this intuitive, I'm not so sure it's widespread, which is kind of too bad because yeah. it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Mackenzie, I think you kind of started off where uh, you know when you feel this and it's great when you feel this because you know that someone is at least being somewhat thoughtful about uh, you and your uh, uh, development on some level. Um, and then just to keep in mind that, you, you know, when you, um, you know, rise to that level of responsibility, that it's something that uh, you can continue, you know, to utilize yourself personally, I guess. I think it helps too if you tell people what you're doing share yeah. the model with them and say here's how um it makes sense to me to to approach this i like that yeah. communication obviously is always really important and then especially if you're straightforward about 
your approach to how you'll you're thinking about managing them I like that it's um like a two-sided conversation mm -hmm. instead of your manager just being like well this is what this is how I'm managing you and you not even knowing that you're being managed in that way or having any say in it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. management is hard yeah I think it you know on some level this can also you know help you personally make a case for you know where you're at and how you're developing if you feel like someone is holding on to you a bit in terms of uh, you know who you you know report to so if you feel like you're staying in quadrant one or two and you're really not receiving that supportive behavior i mean those are the things that we hear you know fairly regularly in public service and nonprofit spaces that folks don't have the opportunity to grow and so you know as we think about you know the size of you know many of our nonprofit and public service organizations you know it's one thing to say you know our organization is too small for folks to really be able to grow um, but it's another thing to say or grow into you know different position levels i should add that to it but it's a completely different thing as to how um, you know, a particular leader at a particular organization is treating you as an individual in terms of coaching you to the point to where you've grown in your role, um, your competencies are high, and your motivations and intentions toward the mission of your organization uh, remains high and at a, at a level that is appreciated kind of based on, uh, you, you know, mission-based work. I guess if you get the sense that uh, a leader is holding you back, I think that this would give you a framework anyways to 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 argue on your behalf on some level. Hey, Brian, you happen to have a little bit of management experience. <laughs> Say I some things, that. please. <laughs> <laughs> No, not at all. I think this is just great. Uh, I mean, it's an excellent tool um, for, you know, growth. And I think, you know, the only thing I was thinking too is it applies upward, right? When you work with your boards and your commissions or your uh, elected officials, um, you do a lot of the coaching and supporting, uh, not necessarily the delegating per se, uh, they do that to you, but um, the directing. I, and I think, you know, regardless of where you are in your uh, career, whether you're a manager, a leader, or even, um, you know, uh, within the organization as an employee, um, we all have to be mindful that these four quadrants are very important, right? Even if you're working as a colleague to say, hey, you know, uh, let's make sure we're on the same page. Let's communicate. Let's collaborate. So I think Dr. Taylor, you're doing a great job. And Dr. Curry, insightful advice. Uh, well taken. Yeah, thanks, Brian. The the you, you, one component of this that I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to was how this can so easily uh, start over, which was the reason why I mentioned um, you can have the most tenured person, but then you start a new program, and then mm -hmm. your your learning starts all over based on some new program or some new database or whatever it may be where again, you, you still have to be thoughtful about, um, okay, uh, you know, how do I treat Kenny now that, you know, this new certificate has started, Will? <laughs> you know, but, but, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it, it, it starts over, my guess is quite a bit. Um, an organization grows and now there's more responsibility than yeah. uh, say some one person has ever you know, had before. And again, kind of back to Mackenzie's point, uh, I'm not sure who's all on the call with us. I know, um, you know, folks with, you know, several years of tenure, but what I always go back to in terms of why this has been so meaningful for me was really in my role as a new executive where I was responsible for leading people and I needed a way to think about this stuff and didn't have it at the time, especially uh, again, in the nonprofit sector, uh, much less than what, you know, Deborah mentioned in terms of, 
you know, in corporate environments and what people know, because you're really kind of out there flying on your own on some level in those roles, but we need something to think about. And this is just one way to do so. Hey, Kenny, what do you think about with um, how we actually could apply this from executive directors to boards? Because I see frequently um, when I'm working with EDs, they get nervous, you know, they're waiting for their board to delegate or they're waiting to, like Brian said, or they're waiting to please their board or trying to but the reality is often our board members, even if they're extraordinarily successful in their own fields, they come to us, they still need the direction and coaching piece. And sometimes yeah. there's sort of a power imbalance that prevents that from happening. What, what advice would you give there? Oh, geez, <laughs> that's, that's great, uh, Angela. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, one of the things, it took me a while, I guess what I reflect on based on the question that you threw out there, is it really took me a while, uh, but I was so happy when I got there, was that I needed to, you know, on some level confront my board as an executive and let them know that they were not the experts in this stuff and, you know, put it on the line to where uh, just like you have to build individual relationships with board members to go out and be successful at fundraising, I would say, building these individual relationships as a nonprofit executive or public servant, building as an executive, building relations, individual relationships with board members based on this to make sure that early on you can direct them and then you can coach them to get them to a point to where they're truly being supportive of uh, the work that's being done. Um, you know, fundraising is certainly uh, one thing, but I know I personally ran into, you know, in Austin, I had several entrepreneurs on my board and most of those conversations were folks that felt like they could do the work better. And most of it just, just did not apply in the nonprofit sector. So I felt like I had a responsibility to take this role of directing, coaching, supporting and delegating to them so that they could be successful in their roles as board member, but kind of based on that power dynamic that you just mentioned, I mean, that's a tough role for a young executive to take on, but I would certainly encourage folks try to find their way there as soon as possible, because in mission-based work, I mean, you really, at some point in your career, have to put it on the line um, uh, to, to lead a board in that way. And I, I wouldn't think that that's that comfortable because it wasn't for me at one period of time, but it got more comfortable as I kind of thought about the back end of my career at my organization and being a little okay with, with knowing that I was probably transitioning out, but that's not what we need to be advocates of out to the sector. We need to be advocates of, you know, nonprofit leaders being able to work with boards in this way as well, too. I don't know if that provides some perspective. Oh, oh sure it does. does. So just, I, I have a gentleman that I've worked with now for nearly 20 years. And I, he lets me tell this story because we both learned so much from it. I was 25 and was the chief development officer and he was my development chair on the board. Incredibly successful, self-made entrepreneur kind of dude. No one left him. He was such a good manager that no one leaves his organization unless they retire or they're asked to leave. And I mean, it's incredible, the retention rate. So I just fell in love with working with him. I was learning so much but I couldn't understand why he wouldn't ask questions at board meetings. And mm -hmm. it was so hard for me to understand as a young, you know, staff member, it's like, you're going, you're so much smarter than our ED, frankly, because this, this was the case that that was, that truly was the case. He had much more mm -hmm. experience. Um, the individual came from a teaching background and hadn't had the opportunity to experience a lot of, you know, business and management. So this, if you put this entrepreneur in front of this, you know, new executive, he could have learned a lot, but he wouldn't ask questions. It took me forever to figure this out. And we finally had a talk about it. And it was because he's like, I don't know that much about education. It came down to a personal thing for him. Mm -hmm. He felt he struggled in school, which he eventually ended up telling me his educational background. And he's a, a very smart man. But he had this sort of feeling that he, because the executive director had a PhD, that the executive director knew more than him, so he shouldn't raise it. So it, it really dug into all these like psychological and personal elements of a board member that when you think, 
wow, we're so lucky that we've got the CEO on our board. It showed me that they still need us to coach them a little bit and help to support them in this role. And I ended up saying, you know what, if you think, because he kept saying something smells fishy and I'd say, well then ask. <laughs> but it was, you know, I, as a 25 year old was so surprised that I was trying to having to tell this board member to ask, you know, and once we got everyone together, the organization really did well because we had a lot of the good elements, but he was just afraid to, you know, he was intimidated really to use his own skill set and to bring it to the board and he needed somebody to just nudge him. So Great that's all right. We, we tell that story when we can to, to folks when they're struggling with this power imbalance. Yeah, one thing that I found useful, and, and you did it, I think, Angela, by developing that strong relationship and high level of trust with the individual. Um, another thing to fold into that is if you can talk about these levels in terms of the board's goals for the organization. So if we're going to, in order to meet this goal that we have, um, you know, here's the information that we need to have from you board member, and this will help us reach this goal that you've set. So uh, you, you, you recognize the role of the board in that and um, request information from them that will help you achieve their goals uh, better, faster, whatever. Yeah, and then I think too, you know, Mackenzie's question about the, the the group dynamic there. If if we think about again, at least you know, and then Angela, over to your point, you know, when I used to think about being successful as an organization, I always thought about if my board is doing well, we will be doing well. So that individual responsibility for that executive director to take on whatever level one board member is at a time to the next. So uh, the only way really truly to understand that just like you want folks to go out and be successful as individual board members to go out and raise money, you know, the same thing with just the overall organizational performance is that relationship, that one-to-one -one relationship between that executive and that executive taking on that one board member to understand exactly where they're coming from is, is, is intimidating and, and and, and, and just a lot of work when you say, I need to do this individually for each board member as an executive to work with them along the lines of a model right. like this. Yeah, and you know, I like, I share it for some of our, our newer career folks because to me, it was just really confusing. So I am 25 and here are these really successful people 25 years older than me and why aren't they asking questions themselves? Like I didn't, I didn't recognize my own role and how I could help, you know, use my relationships and bring this to, you know, bring the executives and the board members together. Um, and it, it was just a, a really confusing thing for me to figure out. And I hope maybe, you know, having an example will give you and some of the tips that everyone shared will help you as you face that. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate your time, everyone. Uh, next week, we have Dr. Angela Seward. And uh, she's going to lead a conversation on uh, donors are giving. So how do we keep them with uh, two of our alumni, uh, Nicole Gabler and uh, Cody Smith. Can't wait to see them. And then uh, for anyone that's interested, uh, I think uh, I didn't follow the chat as much this time around, uh, but we always put the videos and the slide decks on our resources link um, that you can find through visiting our webpage at bush.tamu.edu forward slash nonprofit. And again, we thank you for your time today and for hanging with us and supporting uh, these webinars. Thank you so much.